Welcome to lecture 16. This is the final lecture of this course. Today we're going to carry on talking about neural networks and we're going to discuss the content addressable memory challenge that I set in the last lecture. And as a little finale, we'll have a little chat about how that idea of how we solve con uh, the content addressable memory challenge, how that relates to state-of-the-art error correcting codes that were uh, discovered in uh, the late 90s. So we'll come full, full circle back to the topic of the original first lecture when we talked about error correcting codes for noisy channels. So I've highlighted in red here the two things we're doing today. And I'd like to just remind you what the content addressable memory challenge is. This is going to be the main thing we'll look at today. The challenge is to understand how on earth brains um, do content addressable memory. How do we fill in the gaps? How do we recognize things based on their contents, even when some of the cues are noisy? And a precise way of saying this challenge is try and make a model of it. Make a dynamical system that can do content addressable memory. And I'll show you today a solution to this problem. The task is to have a dynamical system with 25 variables. Each memory is a 25-bit state, and the dynamical system should have 25 variables that change uh, in such a way that you've got fixed points of the dynamics at these, say, three desired memories. Whatever memories you're, you're given, you should be able to make fixed points at those memories. And the dynamical system should have parameters that determine um, the dynamics, and it's by adjusting those, say, 300 parameters, that you should be able to make the fixed points at the right places. And those fixed points should be attracting fixed points, so if you're near to one of the desired memories, the dynamics should take you to that memory. Um, so if you've added some noise to a memory, the noise gets cleaned up. That uh, in itself would already be an exciting thing to solve. And it would look like this. If you flip, say, three bits of a D, then you'd like the dynamics of the dynamical system to take you back to a cleaned up D. A noisy C should turn in, be turned into a C. And this thing is a noisy J, and it should be turned into that. That's the this, this sort of goal of this problem. And that sounds already hard enough. Um, an additional constraint is when your brain encounters a new memory, uh, you don't go out and buy some extra neurons from uh, Dixon's. You just carry on using the same brain and make some minor changes to it. We don't know how, uh, but by those instantaneous changes that can be made very rapidly, possibly with a little bit of sleep um, required, um, you get your new memories added to the existing hardware. And in addition to being able to add extra memories incrementally with small changes. We would like to have the property that your dynamical system can go out for a drink and suffer brain damage and still carry on working pretty well. So we'd like a dynamical system where a uh, nasty person can come along and randomly delete half of the parameters that you've learned. Um, and the dynamic should still actually work. It should still have attracting fixed points that should still be roughly at the original memories. OK, so that's what we're going to do. And I just want to emphasize how dif different this is from the sort of standard solution. Um, well, is there a standard solution to content addressable memory? Let, let's just invent an orthodox approach, write it out just to emphasize how different our solution is going to be. So what would an orthodox approach be? Well, you could have a piece of memory that contains the different memories. They have a little label saying, here's memory number one, number two, and number three. And then your dynamical system could take a state, let's call it x, and we could create little comparators, which measure how far x, the state is, from memory 1. So you have a sort of subtraction operation that 
compares those bits or a distance operation. And you have another piece of hardware that does a distance operation comparing the second memory to X. And you have another piece of hardware that compares the third memory to X. And then you could have a piece of hardware that measures how big those differences are. And we're interested in which one of these is the closest. And so we compute all of these differences, these distances, sorry. And then we compare and find the minimum of these. So we need some sort of argmin machine whose output is an identification of which of those three is the winner. And let's say that x is actually closest to the j in this case. Um, then it could, you could imagine a little light coming on here that says this one's the closest. And then finally we need a piece of hardware that responds to that light and says, okay, let's overwrite x by copying in the contents of j into x if I'm the winner. And the similar lines from this guy saying if I'm the winner, then I get to overwrite x with this and so forth. Are you with me? The sort of logic of what you could do. You could write a computer program that does this as well. It could have a loop and it could say for memory number runs from 1 to m the number of memories. Do a comparison. Keep a list of how far away we are. Then go and uh, figure out which was the closest one. Then go back, look up that memory and overwrite it. Okay, so you could write a program or you could have a piece of hardware with all these different bits. So you'd have a memory area. You'd have a distance vector or a difference a difference vector computation area these would be your distances and so forth okay does that have any of the attributes we just wanted well if you want to add an extra memory you have to get some more hardware and you have to add more comparison um, hardware that measures how far away things are. You have to add this, you have to upgrade your argmin so that now it takes four things to see which is the, the smallest. And so you have to do a whole load of rewiring to, to augment this and add in another memory. And if someone comes along and says, here are some of your adjustable parameters, the, um, I'm going to, whoops, accidentally um, splat a few of these, then this whole dynamical system is going to compute how far x is from messed up c. And if messed up c is the winner, then you'll end up recalling messed up c. So it has the property that if you mess any of this, these parameters up, you will have messed up um, the recall. So it doesn't have robustness to the slightest bit of damage. And if you come in and sort of tinker with the subtraction operation hardware similarly, you will be in trouble. So this would be an orthodox way of saying which is the closest memory? OK, and now let's uh, write that one into x. And it's, it is a content addressable memory, but it doesn't have any of the robustness we want, nor the extensibility. I described it as a one-step orthodox solution here, where you just see which are we closest to, then go all the way. Another way of making it a bit more sort of dynamic and gradual would be to say, um, if you are the winner, then you get to tug x a little bit towards you. Uh, and so it could, x could step a little bit in the direction of the winning one. And then as this thing iterates and settles, it would end up uh, being tugged um, continuously towards whichever one it was closest to in the first place. So you could make it a, a little bit more um, sort of... Um, naturalistic, but still 
useless for our purposes. It doesn't have any of the properties we were after. Something I'd like you to notice about this orthodox approach to content addressable recall is what I've just drawn on the board here is exactly the same as a perfect brute force decoder for an error correcting code whose code words are the lists uh, of words in here. Assuming that this distance measurement that you end up with here is the correct dis distance measurement for the um, log likelihood um, for your channel model. So if, if this is measuring how many bits are flipped between D and X, then this would be the correct decoder, assuming we're dealing with a binary symmetric channel. So there's a connection brewing here. That this, this may remind you a bit of decoding error correcting codes. Uh, decoding an error correcting code is indeed sort of an example of content addressable memory, uh, though when we made error correcting codes, we didn't think of the code words as being memories that we wanted to recall. Okay, so that's how you would do it orthodoxly. And I gave you a homework challenge to come up with a solution. And I will now show you a solution that was invented uh, by John Hopfield to this problem. So Hopfield's solution is to use a neural network, which is a feedback network. That means it's built out of neurons, just like the neurons we had before. Neurons that add up weighted inputs and send out outputs. But the wiring of the Hopfield network will have connections both ways between all pairs of neurons. So every neuron's output gets broadcast to every other um, neuron. Another way of drawing this would be to say, here's all the outputs of all the neurons. And they all come around on a little racetrack like this. And then this is where they gather their inputs. One, two, three, four. One, two, three four, and so forth. And these places here, one, two, three, four, these 16 places here are where the weights exist. Which you can think of if I've got I neurons, then there's an I times I weight matrix connecting them. So let's go through how a Hopfield network works. I've, in fact, told you everything you need to know. It's made of neurons. They're wired up. And so here are the relevant equations. The architecture of the network is, is a feedback network. A rule for the standard Hopfield network is the weights are actually symmetric. So the weight uh, between neuron 1 and neuron 3 is actually equal to the weight going from neuron 3 to neuron 1. The activity rule is each of the neurons computes its activation. AI is sum over J, WIJ, XJ plus theta I. So every neuron can have a little bias dangling off it as well, called theta. So here's theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and theta 4. And then having computed that activation, you've got a choice of two ways of doing it. One is that xi, the output, which comes along here, x1, x2, x3, x4, xi is the hyperbolic tangent of your activation, which looks like that. Or another option is the extreme, um, if you like, low temperature limit of the hyperbolic tangent function, where you just have a step. And that's called the binary Hopfield network, where each neuron just sets itself to up or down, depending with it, whether it's local field, its activation is positive or negative. OK, and here's John Hopfield, who uh, now works at Princeton in his retirement. OK, that's the Hopfield network. I haven't actually told you how to do content addressable memory. To do content, content addressable memory, we need a rule for setting all of these weights. So in the example problem with 25 dimensional binary patterns to learn, the number of neurons we'll have is 25. 
the number of weights is 25 times 24. There's no self-connections in this network. And they're symmetric, so it's 25 times 24 over 2 is the number of parameters. Parameters. And those are called WIJ. And what we need is a rule for setting them. And the extremely simple rule, there are other ways of doing this, but the simplest one to go with in order to solve this content addressable memory challenge is to say, let's set the weights, which are roughly 300 in number, in this way, using a HEB rule. So the HEB rule says you set the connection between i and j by seeing how correlated xi and xj are with each other in all of the patterns that you want to learn. So n is the number of patterns to learn, which in my DJC example would be 3. Or once you add an m, then n will have become 4. This is called the Heb rule because it's a very simple idea from biology named after a chap called Donald Heb. The idea is if you've got a pair of neurons and they're responding to something, and if there's a connection between them, then maybe that connection strengthens in proportion to how correlated the activities of the neurons are. So if this is a neuron that tends to respond to yellow colored things being in the scene, and if this is a neuron that responds to the smell of banana, and if those two things uh, happen in a correlated way in the world, so these neurons fire in a correlated way, then the synapse between them will get strengthened, which then means that if in the world a yellow thing comes along, you may actually start smelling the smell of banana, even though there isn't a banana smell there. That's the idea of Hebbian learning. And just to emphasize, those sort of associations, that's the sort of thing that content addressable memory is all about. And there are many other examples of strong associative mechanisms in our brains and in the brains of animals. One I'd like to just mention as an aside is the amazing McGurk effect, which is an illusion where you see a video of someone speaking some uh, phonemes like ba, pa, da, fa. And the audio track has their voice saying some phonemes. But actually, sneakily, they've switched up what the video is doing and what the soundtrack is doing. And if you ignore the video, you hear the phonemes perfectly clearly. But when you see the visual image of them saying different phonemes, you get a complete override. You, you don't hear the correct phoneme anymore because of this strong association of the visual image of them saying pa or ba or fa. When you see that image, it, it can actually override what your ears are telling your brain. It's an amazing phenomenon. OK, so we have got ourselves a learning rule. It's called the Heb rule. And we're now ready to go ahead and demonstrate the Hopfield network. So what I'm going to do is train up a Hopfield network with its 25 times 24 over 2 weights using these three patterns, DJC. And here are the weights that you get when you run the HEB rule. Let's just hop back and explain where these weights came from. So I'll use the mouse, shall I? Here's the first weight. It's the weight between neurons 1 and 2, and it's equal to 1. Well, why is that? Here's neuron 1, here's neuron 2, or in this pattern, 1 and 2, or in this one, 1 and 2. Now, you take your HEB rule, it says, what's the correlation? We're calling each of these patterns plus or minus 1, depending whether it's a splop or a dot. Uh, so two splops give you a plus 1, and two dots gives you a plus 1 when you run your HEB rule. And a splop and a dot give you a minus 1. So we get plus 1 when we work out x1 times x2 in this case. That, so our HEB rule first looks at that pattern, and you get a plus 1 for that weight. Then you look at this pattern, and you get another plus 1. So the weight goes up to 2. And then you look at the third pattern, and you get minus 1, because they're anti-correlated. So it goes back down to 1. And that's why this weight is 1. Now, let's look at the weight between neurons 2 and 3. They are in the same state here. Splop, 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 OK, in all of those. And here's row 2, column 3, or row 3, column 2, if you like. 
and we've got plus three. So in every case, you've got a plus one because they're in the same state as each other. Neurons three and four, that's this three here. Again, if you look at the patterns, they're all the same. And so logically, neurons two and four have to be the same in all states as well. And you've got another plus three there. Okay, so I've made all the weights just by running through all the patterns, looking at every pair of neurons and either adding one or subtracting one as you look at a pattern. Notice this rule is incremental. You can learn the first two patterns if you want, and then having learned them, you can go through and add the third pattern, and that will just involve taking all the weights and shoving some of them up by one and some of them down by one. All right. Now, off we go. We're going to run the dynamics, and I'm just going to run the binary hot field network that, uh, where each neuron is either up or down and uh, on or off. And I'll run through the neurons in sequence. So the dynamics I told you on the, uh, the earlier slide when we said, what's the hot field network do? Um, I said, the activity rule is you compute your activation, then you set XI using a step function. And I didn't tell you how you do that precisely. I'm actually going to run through them one at a time in sequence, updating them. And then I'll go back to the top, and I'll run through a second time, and I'll run through a third time until I get bored. All right? So that's the particular way of implementing the dynamics. You could imagine also synchronously updating all of them, but I'm, I'm not doing that. It wouldn't make much difference, in fact. OK, so let's start by actually initiating the dynamical system at one of the desired memories. So let's wipe the silly old orthodox way of doing things and make ourselves a little diagram to keep track of what happens. So once we've learned the memories, we completely throw away D, J, and C. There's no such thing in there. We've just got the weights connecting the neurons to each other. And what I'm going to do is make a little diagram where we see if we set off the network in the state D, J, and C, do we actually have a fixed point at all? So you can think of the state space of this dynamical system as having a D location in it, a J location, and a C location. And what we're going to do is test, OK, if I set off this dynamical system at a D, where does it go? Because you could easily imagine the dynamics could take it somewhere else. It might sort of wander off and go who knows where. So we're going to find out what happens. And here's what happened. After one iteration, which means every neuron got the chance to update itself in accordance with the rules, nothing happened. So it is a stable point. That doesn't say it's an attracting fixed point, but it is a fixed point. So. First column here is going to say no noise. And we're going to put a little tick that says the D was a fixed point. That's pretty cool. Next, we set it off in the J, and we find that the J is a fixed point as well. Then we go for the C, and the C is also a fixed point. So we get tick, tick, tick. If there's no noise, it's a fixed point. Now, the content addressable memory challenge says we want it to be an attracting fixed point. If we flip a few bits, we want the dynamics to take us back to those fixed points. So let's start doing that. We're now going to flip a single bit of the D. And then we run the dynamics, and all the neurons get a chance to change themselves. And what you find is the one that was flipped unflips itself. And we get back to the D, and it's stable. OK. So this is approximately 4% noise, because we're flipping 1 out of 25. So at a 4% noise level, the D came through OK. J, C. Right, so single flips have all been discovered, corrected, and we have a working contextual memory that seems, on the basis of this tiny amount of evidence, I'm not exhaustively looking at all single flips, but it has corrected all those single flips. Next, let's flip some more single uh, bits. D, J, C. All of those got corrected. And that third one, it actually, there were two flips. The both neurons one and two got flipped. And then the dynamics have cleaned that up. So it can correct two flips as well. So we're up to 10% or so. And it's still working. There's a J with three flips. OK, so we're up to 13%. And 
things are still working. There's a C with three flips, and that got cleaned up. Say again? Okay. So the way my software works is it always rotates through them, DJC, 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 and tests and flips. So when it says setting up three with 0.14 noise, it's picking memory number three, and it makes three flips. And so you can check that it was actually three flips away. Now, it, your question is a very good question, because I'm just going to keep on cranking up the noise level until it stops working. And you would very much expect it not to work if we're flipping, say, 50% of the bits. Because if you take any pattern and flip 50% of the bits, it's just pure random noise, yeah? So at this point, we definitely expect D, J, and C all not to be recalled. It would be completely bizarre if it worked there. So it's going to stop working, but I'm just going to rotate through them, adding more and more noise. OK, so that starting pattern there, it's, you know, for a human, maybe it looks a little bit difficult. You know, is that a C? Yes, you think about it, and you say, yeah, OK, it's a C. There's a noisy D with three flips, corrected, a J, and a C. Now we're flipping four, so we're up to 18%. And we're still getting ticks. What was that one? That was a C, corrected. A D with four flips. A J. And a C. OK, so full house there. And the noise level is up to 22%. Flipping five bits. D. J is taking more iterations sometime to, to do the cleanup. So that's apparently a noisy J, though it's quite hard for us to tell now. Uh, so six bits have been flipped. We're up to 24%. And that's a noisy J, which got cleaned up. That's a noisy C. But you might struggle to recognize it, but it's getting the right answer. OK, so pretty good, hey? What's next? That's a noisy D, six flips. That's a noisy J. That's a noisy C. I think you might struggle to look at that and say it's a noisy C, but it's still working. So we're up to 29% noise. And that was a C, so still working. Noisy D with seven flips. Noisy J. And there was a noisy C. And what happened? It got turned into a J. All right, and that was with 33% noise. So that was our first failure in this little sequence of experiments. So tick, tick. OK, so something bad has started happening. But we could just double check. OK, when we made that noisy C, um, <laughs> we added a load of noise. Blah, blah, blah. The number of flips was eight flips. And we could just do a quick computation now. How far away was that initial state that we got ourselves to here from the J? Because it, if, in fact, it's equally close to the J, then we shouldn't really complain about this dynamical system giving us a J. So let's just check. Uh, so I'll count across um, uh, here. So we're looking at co comparing these two with each other. So one flip, two flips, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's nine flips away from the J and eight flips away from the C. So you could complain, but hey, the difference was only one flip between how far it was from the J and from the C. So it it's almost reasonable. If, if all you wanted was a basin of attraction around here, and you've got a basin of attraction around here, and this one just happens to be a little bit bigger, you can hardly complain. OK, let's keep going. Uh, let's add more noise. Eventually, because we'll just be adding loads of noise, what we're doing is not adding a bit of noise and seeing if we get home. We're just picking completely random starting points and saying, what happens now? to this dynamical system. And there's quite a lot of behaviors that we haven't yet seen. So let's keep going. This is a noisy D, and it gave us a C. All right, so that's another failure. But again, it's probably justifiable. This is a noisy J, and it gives us a J. OK, so we're still getting some successes. Here's a noisy C, and it gave us a C. OK, so <laughs> still some successes. Noisy D. 
success. <laughs> Noisy J. Aha! What's happened there? What's that? The dynamics have gone somewhere. Every other time we ran the dynamics, we ended up in a D, a J, or a C. And now we've run the dynamics, and we've got into, what do you want to call that? Q, all right? So it's discovered the letter Q. So we added some noise to a J, and we've got ourselves to a place where we then went downhill. I say downhill, and we haven't proven that there's any hill at all. We've gone into a, we've gone through some dynamics, and we've ended up in a stable state which has been named Q by the audience. All right, and we can just sort of make a note of what a Q means. It's sort of this. <laughs> Looks a bit like that, yeah? Sort of D-ish and J-ish at the same time. Though it's not actually a D. It's that left-hand side isn't the way Ds look. So, yeah, I think Q is a good name. Right, so that, that was a new exciting thing. We, the the dynamical system we've made has got fixed points that are attracting fixed points at D and J and C, but it's got some other fixed points as well, which have just, uh, who, who knows why they're there, but they're there. Here's a noisy C. What's happened now? We flipped 10 bits of a C, and then we ran the dynamics, and what state are we in now? Somewhere between a D and a C. Remember what Ds look like. Um, Ds look like that. So how is this thing related to a D? It's anti-D, okay? So over here in state space is anti-D, where everything is perfectly flipped. And here's anti-J, and here's anti-C. So states exist called anti-D, anti-J, and anti-C, and it looks like anti-D is a stable attracting fixed point that we've somehow got into by flipping a C. So we did some flips, and we've gone downhill, or sorry, we've run the dynamics, and we've ended up in anti-D. And again, we could check, you know, we're flipping 10 bits now, which is almost 50%. So we're definitely just exploring random starting points now. It's completely irrelevant that we started from C. Uh, we're just saying, what other fixed points does this system have? And does it only end up in fixed points, or could it do chaotic things? OK, so it goes totally totally and it's in anti-D. And when you reflect on it, it's actually quite obvious that the learning rule that we had is completely insensitive to flipping all elements of X. So if you told the learning rule, please learn anti-D, J, and C instead, it would learn exactly the same weights, because you just have a minus 1 times minus 1, which is plus 1. All right? So the learning rule is completely agnostic, and the dynamic, dynamics are agnostic to so that complete change of sign of a single pattern. And that means if there is a fixed point at D, there must be a fixed point at anti-D as well. OK, so it's actually not a surprise in retrospect that there is this fixed point here. Let's add some more noise. What's that? Anti-C, all right. Let's uh, add some noise to J, and we get J. OK, so that's, we're still getting, <laughs> even here, we could call this a sort of success, but we're just exploring random conditions. Uh, OK, there's a random uh, initial condition, 11 flips of a C, and it gives us, what's that? Say. It's part of a J, but it's not a J. So it's sort of, yeah, a strange J with, it's missing its bottom corner, it's missing the upright. So we need a name for that. Uh, shall we call it Aleph or something like that? So we've discovered another um, point. Uh, I'll, I'll draw it. There it is. So there's a thing that looks like that, and that's a fixed point too. So we've got a Q, which was an unintended uh, fixed point that attracts, and we have an attracting fixed point at this aleph -y thing. OK, and there it is again. OK, there's a C, and there's a J. So J seems very good at attracting the dynamics. So J has a strong base, and here's anti-J. So anti-J obviously must, by symmetry, have uh, equally as big a basin of attraction as J has got. So these have both got huge basins that get lots of um, random initial conditions sucking into them. Okay, 
So what have we learned? It works. It's a content addressable memory. And it's got some spurious fixed points at places we didn't intend, but that doesn't really matter. What I'm now going to do is part two of the challenge was, will this thing still work when you take it for a drink and damage its neurons? OK, so you have a drink. Yes, question? OK, so the question was, how do you read things out? It's generating false memories. Well, it's only generating, what do you mean by generating false memory? If you mean you might accidentally learn some things from your own dynamics that don't exist, um, then the, say again? The, the, I never showed it a queue, but it has a fixed point at queue. But was that in the rules of how a content addressable memory should work? The definition of a content addressable memory is if you show it a noisy version of a memory, it should restore to the original memory. And this does that. There wasn't a rule that said, uh, if I give you completely random inputs, you should only ever produce um, a correct memory. That wasn't part of the, the job specification. All right? Nevertheless, if, if you want to add that to the job specification, we can do that, and we can make neural net learning algorithms that will essentially fantasize, come up with random ideas, and check that their fantasies are still consistent with reality. So th there is a, an enormous literature on interesting um, learning algorithms for neural nets. And your, your idea that, oh, you should make sure you don't have spurious fantasies, that's essentially what many of these algorithms are about. Are about. The, they involve exposing the brain to reality and then having a dreaming phase when at night you go and dream and then you make sure that the statistics of your dreams are consistent with the statistics of reality. That's, that's one of the themes. Okay. So the, yeah, the way the learning works is you just expose it to the training examples and you say, learn this, learn this, learn this, run the Heb rule, blop, 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 and then we have a dynamical system. So you can call these false memories if you want. Um, I don't know, they're just spurious states of a dynamical system. Yep, false memories is also um, a, a fair enough name. What we're going to do now is corrupt the weights. So we're going to take the weight matrix that we learned with the Heb rule, but then I'm going to leap in and destroy some of the weights. So all of the weights were either plus 1, plus 3, minus 1, or minus 3 but I'm just going to take a fraction of those weights at random and set them to zero. And then we'll rerun the dynamics. So here's some randomly corrupted weights. The fraction corrupted is 79 out of 300. And now we're going to rerun the whole game that we just played. We're going to say, is there a fixed point at the letter D? So we put in a D. And we run the dynamics, and we find, uh, yes, there's a fixed point. In fact, what I've done is I've flipped three bits. So I'm, I'm taking, I'm going all the way to here, sort of 13%-ish. And I'm saying, is there an attracting fixed point at D? So not only is there a fixed point, but it is an attracting fixed point. And D, J. See, the D is OK for this example of flipping three bits. Let's take a J and flip three bits. And there's a fixed point at J. Let's take a C, flip three bits, and there is a fixed point at C. So that is weak evidence that there's sort of ticks all over here as well, but let's not waste time. And we could go to higher noise levels and see how big these attracting fixed points are, and we could explore and see is there still a spurious one at Q and one at Aleph and all that sort of thing as well. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to uh, corrupt some more weights. So now we're going to destroy more than half. So 158 of the 300 weights have now been set to zero. And we rerun the dynamics, and we say, if I take a D and add some noise, where do I go? And the answer is to a fixed point that isn't quite exactly the D, but it's only different by one bit, which I think is a pretty good situation, given that we've destroyed more than half of the parameters in the network. So now. We're almost right, so I'll give it a tick with a twiddle that just says one bit is off in this fixed point. Noisy J gets cleaned up, and that's a J. So that's a success. Noisy C gets turned into a C. 
So we've destroyed more than half the weights and it's still working. And if we had time, we could explore what's happened to this boundary here um, of where it stops working. So it was somewhere hereabouts. Presumably there's some boundary and maybe it comes through sort of hereabouts. And eventually if I destroy enough weights, presumably the whole thing is gonna stop working down here. So there's some sort of boundary and we've just got a vague indication that it might look something like that green line. Let's destroy some more weights just to check. Okay, so here we destroy 237 of the weights at random. And the question is, what's happened to the D, the J, and the C? Which side of the green line have we, we gone? So we put in a noisy D and we get something that is now two flips away from a D. All right, so, okay, except not really that great. Put in a noisy J and we get mumbo jumbo, rubbish. So that's not very good. It's still got a fixed point. So the dynamics have fixed points, but that's not what we wanted. And there's a noisy C, which is one flip away. Okay, so given that none of those have been correctly stored, I think it's fair enough to say the, the green line is perhaps somewhere on that, that side. And maybe look something like that. Okay, there's a huge literature on Hebb rules for hot field networks if you want to actually know where that boundary goes and clever physicists have uh, got explicit uh, closed form solutions for, for this uh, diagram that we've just sketched. Now, what shall we do? What was the other definition of a content addressable memory? You should be able to add some extra memories to it by a small change, a small incremental change, and it should still have all the old memories and the new one. So what we're now going to do is make another diagram where we vary the noise level again from zero to say 15% or more. And we just found that D, J, and C can be learned. And now we're going to say, let's add one more memory. So we've got N is four or maybe even five, or maybe even six. But at some point, we imagine this thing might not work. And what we've established so far is that this worked out to sort of 29 percent-ish here. So this was all ticks up to here. Probably, maybe, not sure. We didn't actually look at every single noise pattern, but lots of ticks happened up to 29%. And now we're going to add another memory called M. So there is the M pattern. And what does that mean we do with the weights? Well, every weight either goes up by one or down by one, because you just look at the correlation within the M pattern of the spins with each other. So for example, this one, which used to be, what was it? Plus one was the connection between these two. Now, in the M, you can see they're in opposite states, so it's gone back down to zero. So that's why that weight has become zero when it was plus one. All right, and this weight has gone up to four. That's the weight between two and three, and they are both in the dot state here. So that's why we've got an extra plus one, and that weight has gone up to four. So all the weights have just been tweaked a tiny little bit. The, the least significant bit of every weight has just been nudged a little bit up or down. And that tiny change, we hope, has created a completely new fixed point that didn't exist before. Uh, you can take, take it from me. I can prove it if you, if you want. The previous dynamical system did not have a fixed point at M. Now we make this tiny change to it, and we put in a D, and it's still a fixed point. We put in a J, it's a fixed point. Put in a C, it's a fixed point. And you put in an M, and it's a fixed point too. So we have fixed points. Are they attracting fixed points? Let's add a little bit of noise and find out. So one bit flipped is corrected for the D, the J, the C, and the M. Okay, so that was all right. One flip corresponding to 5% noise. All right, next let's try flipping a bit more. Here's another one flip. I'm going a bit more slowly now because uh, I I want to be honest with you about when this thing stops working. So that's one flip, corrected, a noisy J, 
a noisy C with one flip, and that's all fine too. Here's a noisy M, and that was fine too. Okay, so we've had two runs through, all at 5% noise. One flip. Okay, here's another run, D, J, C, and M. Okay, those were all okay. So it seems pretty good at cleaning up single bit flips. Noisy D, J, C, and M. All okay. So we had four run throughs, all with single flips. All right, now we're flipping two. So the noise level's got up to 8%, and the D is okay. Noisy D, J, C, M. All right, so that's correcting two flips. Tick, tick, tick. Noisy D, J, C, and M. All of those worked, so four more ticks. Again, those were all two bits being flipped. Noisy D, J, C, and M. Okay, did anyone notice anything? That isn't an M, yeah? What is it? It's two bits away from an M. Yeah? Because what does an M look like? We can't see it anymore. But it's second row and fourth row. They've both got blocks when they should have dots. All right, so that's a failure. It's two bits away. So it's not working absolutely perfectly. It's got another fixed point, but we didn't ask for. And Sometimes when we flip two bits, it finds that fixed point. Noisy D, J, C, M. Okay, so that was a success again. This is still flipping two bits. One, two, three, four. So we've just had one failure out of 16 in the two flip territory. Now we're flipping three bits. D, J, M. Okay, that ain't right, is it? So what's wrong with that? It differs by two, three bits from a J, doesn't it? Because there's top left, and there's this one, and there's this bottom left-hand corner. Um, so those are three bits away. I'll put three twiddles next to that. So it looks a bit like a J, but it isn't the J memory. J, noisy C, that's OK. Noisy M, that's OK. D, J, C, M. D, J, C, noisy M. Okay, so what happened there? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, and a failure. So still quite a lot of successes. D with three flips, J, C, and M. That was another four successes. Okay, so it's not working, but it's only failing in two out of 16 cases at this noise level. Noisy D, J, C, mmm. That's Aleph or something like it, isn't it? And M. All right, so when we're flipping four bits, which is here-ish, 17%-ish, we're getting some uh, failures for sure. Where did, where did I go? Sorry. Let's put it here. So this is four flips, and we're getting some failures. All right, so I've got weak evidence that things are sort of getting bad hereabouts. So it still works, but the basins of attraction aren't quite so big. What should we do next? Five memories. OK, so the memories are now called D, J, C, M, and X is a checkerboard pattern that I picked. All right, so all the weights, which were minus 4, minus 2, 0, 2, or 4, are now changed by plus 1 or minus 1, and they're all odd numbers. All right. Do we have fixed points? Let's try the D. Yes, there's a fixed point. D, J, C, M, and X. So there's a fixed point at D. There is a fixed point at J, at C, and M, and X. OK, so we still have a fixed point. Is it an attracting fixed point? Can we flip some bits? To cut things uh, short, I'm going to go to 15% noise level. So I'm going to flip three bits and see what happens hereabouts. And the answer is noisy D gets turned into anti-M. OK, so that's not very good. Noisy J turns into J. 
Noisy C is OK. Noisy M is OK. And noisy X has got turned into, I don't know what that is. So that was sort of um, bad, OK, 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 and bad, which isn't looking very good. So probably this green line is somewhere like that. OK, so it's not really working anymore. We added a fifth memory, and the basins of attraction, if there, are, if there is a basin at all, they're, they're really quite small. Um, let's try again with the noisy D, noisy J, noisy C, noisy M, um, and noisy X. OK, all of those actually worked, so we had five more successes. Right, six memories. So we're probably pushing our luck now. DJC, M, X, and then there's a, another one which I call S, and they look like this. OK, so that's the six patterns. The weights now will all be even numbers, because we tweak them all up or down by one. And we put in D to check, is it a fixed point? And the answer is no. We get something that looks a bit like S, but it's off by one bit. J is a fixed point. C is not a fixed point. That turned into something that looks like S, but is off by one bit. M is not a fixed point. It's turned into anti-S with one bit flipped. So that's not very good. X turns into S with one bit flipped. And S turns into S with one bit flipped. So uh, that's bad. And this is OK with a little twiddle. Right, so it's really not working anymore, is it? So this green boundary comes in hereabouts at six memories. And if we um, ask the question, could you have made a Hotfield network that did have fixed points at all of these, if only you had used a different learning algorithm instead of the Heb rule? Well, how could we do that? Well, one way to think about it is every one of these neurons is a single neuron that gets inputs from somewhere. And we already have a learning algorithm for training single neurons. Remember when we were training pigeons, sorry, pigeon replacements, to distinguish pe raisins from pebbles. So we could use the learning algorithm for a single neuron to train each neuron to classify the D pattern as a plus one or minus one, depending whether that neuron should be in state plus one or, or minus one when it's in a D, and train this one similarly with every possible input, D, J, C, M, and so forth, with the correct label being blue or yellow, plus one or minus one, depending on whether this one should be up or down in each of those states. So each of them has its own lookup table of what it should do in those, those, those states. And you can run individual learning algorithms for each of them. In fact, they're coupled to each other because the weights have to be symmetric. So you run, you sort of add up all the objective functions and say, let's minimize that objective function. And it is actually possible to come up with a setting of weights which are here. Here are a set of weights that were found by training the algorithm on those six examples with each neuron being told whether it should try to be up or down. And now when you run the dynamics, starting from a D, you get a D. And from a J, you get a J. From a C, you get a C. M goes to M. X goes to X. And S goes to S. So you can still tweak the weights. You just don't use the Heb rule anymore. You, you do something a bit smarter that says, well, what is the objective? And let's check that it's working. And you tweak the weights just a little bit. And we've got fixed points in all the right places. So it was possible to get the Hotfield network to have fixed points here um, if we used a different learning algorithm. Anyway. The main part of the show was the Heb rule, which is so fantastically simple and clearly biologically plausible. It's a very easy algorithm to learn, you, to, to implement. You just have to see, are the neurons in a correlated state or not? And you tweak your synapse strength up or down accordingly. Um, does this thing have attracting fixed points? Well, no. If you add a, a significant amount of noise to a D, you get S. J works. Um, C goes to S. M goes to anti-S, and X with flips goes to S, and S with some flips goes to S. So it's still not working very well, but at least it did have some fixed points in the right place. And I think that might be the end of that show. So there is the Hotfield network. And in my view, it's a pretty exciting solution to the content addressable memory challenge. So 
we've got a candidate solution to content addressable memories, and the Hopfield network is itself an interesting thing. It is a dynamical system that has got fixed points. Well, why has it even got fixed points? Why does it have stable states? How many memories can it learn? What is its capacity? I showed you a tiny example with just three or six memories with 25 neurons. What if you have n much bigger? Um, and if all the neurons are connected to each other, how many bits can you store? How many random patterns can you train this thing on using, say, the, the Hebb rule? And this is an interesting system we've started to study. What else can we do with it? What ideas are inspired by the Hopfield network? I'm going to spend the final 20 minutes or so answering a few of these questions. So first, why does the Hopfield network have some stable states? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if you recognize what we've just been doing. So have you seen these equations before? An activation is a linear sum of x's, and then the x's uh, are obtained by putting the a's, the activations, through a tanch function. Have you seen that before? Yes, you've seen it before, because two lectures ago, we discussed variational methods. We said, imagine if you had a spin system with couplings called J, M, N. Then you want to approximate the nasty, complicated coupled system by a variational approximation. Out popped these equations, which are exactly the same, except J is now called W because they're weights in a neural network. And the H's, which were applied fields, um, local fields in the physics problem, are now the thetas, the biases of neurons. OK, so the equations are identical. We've seen this before. And here was the page of text that we had in the textbook and in the lecture where we derived these equations as a variational approximation to something. That uh, spits out a possible idea about the Hopfield network. Well, since it's an approximation to something, maybe it would be interesting to actually implement the something instead of implementing the approximation. And that idea is called the Boltzmann machine. So a little spin out I'll just mention is Hopfield network is a variational free energy minimization approximation to a probability distribution P of x, which is the same old thing that we had for the spin system, e to the sum over i and j, x, i, w, i, j, x, j, something like that, give or take a possible sign error. And so it's a, an approximation that we could call Q. And that motivates the idea, hey, maybe we could make a neural network that actually implements P, and we could have a whole world of neural networks that actually do P. And that's called the Boltzmann machine. So the Boltzmann machine is the neural net community's name for the stochastic neural network that samples from this distribution. And there's a whole bunch of games you can play with those. You can have learning algorithms where you say, let's train the probability distribution of the bulk machine to have some properties we want, like to assign high probability to some memories that we want to learn. Or you could have other things that you want to do, other, say, associative memory tasks. So there's a literature on bulk machines. And if you want them to do learning, you need to have learning algorithms for them. And just to complete this aside, if you write down what the learning algorithm is for the Boltzmann machine, if what you want it to do is assign high probability to a set of memories, then what you find is the very first step of that learning algorithm is the Hebb rule that we had a moment ago. So if you wondered where did the Hebb rule come from, well, here's one way of deriving it. We write down the real probability distribution write down the learning algorithm, make one step of steepest descent, and you find you've got the Hebb rule. So that's a little aside. Now, the fact that the Hopfield network is associated with the variational free energy means that its dynamics have a Lyapunov function. So that's why the dynamics do have stable states. The dynamics take you downhill on the variational free energy, and because that is a function that is lower bounded by something, it can't go arbitrarily negative, the dynamics have to reach a fixed point. So by observing that we've already seen this thing and it came out of an objective function, we get a, uh, an instant proof of the fact that 
the Hopfield net networks dynamics um, do minimize and reject a function, and therefore there exist um, fixed points. Hopfield net dynamics minimize a variational free energy, therefore there exist fixed points, and the dynamics always go into one of these fixed points and stop. It didn't have to be that way. You can easily write down dynamical systems that don't have uh, objective functions that decrease. It's easy to make chaotic systems that just go bumbly, 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 and uh, randomly wander around and end up in limit cycles and so forth. Now, another question on the list of questions was, what is the capacity of the Hopfield network? And this has been studied by the physics community that got attracted into neural networks. And they have established that if n is very large, and if i is very large, so i is the number of neurons, and n is the number of patterns, incidentally, the number of parameters, then, in the Hopfield network, is roughly i squared over 2. If you make both i and n large, then what you find is that the Hopfield network works for n over i less than a critical value, and it doesn't work at all for n over i above that critical value. So these two graphs here are showing you how good the overlap is between the desired memory that you're trying to uh, recall and the nearest stable state, the nearest fixed point. And you can see if n over i is less than 0.14 or so, then you get very big overlap, which is wonderful, but you go above 0.14 and you get this catastrophic failure. That means that you can learn, they're not learned perfectly instantly. Notice how the black line isn't quite equal to 1 for any value of n over i. Uh, so th there is a fixed point, but it's not quite in the right place. Um, so the, the Hebrew rule almost gets it right, but not quite. There's this critical value, n crit, is 0.138i. That means the number of random bits that you're able to learn and store in these parameters, the number of bits learned, if you're just below that critical point, is roughly n crit times i, because each of the n crit patterns you've learned has i randomly chosen bits in it. So that's roughly i squared times 0.138. And if you take the ratio of this number of bits you've learned to this number of parameters, the ratio is about 0.24 bits per weight. So that's a nice sort of rule of thumb again. In the last lecture, we talked about training a single neuron, and we observed that a single neuron can learn random patterns, random labels for patterns, and it can learn up to two bits per weight. The Hopfield network with the Hebrel can learn 0.24 bits per weight, and then it stops working beyond that. This is a result for random patterns and for the Hebrel. My final question was, what else can we do with these Hopfield network ideas? Well, one idea that John Hopfield himself had was, since the Hopfield network does minimize things, how about we go out into the community of people who try to minimize things because that's their job, and try and solve their problems for them with a Hopfield network. So we say, you want to minimize something? Well, try this brain-like thing. It'll do a minimization for you. So let's give you an example. Um, let's discuss the traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem is the task of picking a tour that visits some cities and you want to minimize the distance, the length of the tour. So, where should we go now? Let's wipe a bit of board. And I'm going to show you first the traveling salesman problem with four cities. And I'll describe how you can map that onto a Hotfield network. So you go to the back page of the road atlas 
and it often has a thing that looks like this, yeah? Which has a list of names of cities on all the rows and cities on here, and these are the distances between the cities, yeah? So you have the distance between cities A and B here, distance between A and C here, distance between A and D here, distance between B and C, and so forth. And you look at that triangle of distances, and then you're told, here are all the cities you must visit, A, B, C, and D. You can look up in that triangle what the distances all are, and you have to pick a tour, which is a sequence of maybe A first, B second, D third, C fourth, and then back to A, so a closed tour, and the task is to find a tour which minimizes the total distance. This task is an NP-complete problem. That means it's hard. I could give a more precise definition, but for our purposes, it just means it's an interesting thing if you can do um, anything on it at all. And we don't expect to have a perfect solution because NP-complete means sufficiently hard that you would um, get an award if you could actually do it perfectly. Okay, so you've got to pick a permutation and you want to minimize the total distance. So the goal is find a permutation of ABCD such that the tour minimizes the total distance. Okay, you can think of this as being a problem with two objectives. The real objective is, is we want to minimize the total distance, but there's another objective lurking in there, which is we do want, please, a permutation. And John Hotfield's approach to this problem, which he did with David Tank, was to make a network which minimizes a single objective function that is a sum, of you, if you like, of these two things, the objective of minimizing the total distance plus the objective of being a permutation. So how do you do that? Well, you make a network representation of a tour-like object that may or may not actually be a tour. Across the top, we have place in tour, does a city come first, second, third, or fourth? And down the left-hand side, we'll have cities, A, B, C, D. And if A comes first, so if the tour is, say, A, C, D, B, C comes second, D comes third, and B comes fourth, then you could imagine switching on these four neurons and switching all the other 12 neurons off. And that would be a way with 16 neurons of representing this particular permutation. There's actually several ways of doing it, because you can slide, you can wrap around in this way, and there's four different ways of representing the same uh, ordered tour. Okay, so that's the network representation. Now we need to wire up the neurons to each other in a way that enforces these two objectives of please make a permutation and please have small total distance. So we need things that enforce permutationness, and we could explicitly have some uber computation that says, is this thing a permutation or not? But that would not be local and it would not be distributed and it wouldn't be a hot field network. The way to do it in a hot field networky way is you say, well, if it's a permutation, then there's only one one in a row, and if there were two ones in, in a row or a column, uh, that would be bad. So something we can do is we can say, let's have negative weights from one neuron to everyone who is in his row, and let's have negative weights to everyone who's in his column. I'm sorry, I said that back to front, but it doesn't matter. So you have negative weights from you to everyone in your row and everyone in your column. And you repeat that for all neurons. Then we need to have a way of actually making the thing care about minimizing a distance as well as just creating a permutation. So how do we do that? 
Well, if this neuron is on here, and if this neuron is on, then that means that B came second and D came third. And now something in this network had better be aware of that and care about the distance between B and D because B has been put next to D. So we're going to have a weight, colored green, for minimizing total distance between these that will be minus the distance between B and D. Similarly, there'll be a minus DBD between those two, a minus DBC between those, and a minus DBA between those, etc. replicated all the way across. All right, so if you're in the same row as each other, you're going to have a red weight connecting you, and the uh, same columns, likewise. If you're in adjacent columns, but different rows, you will have one of these green weights connecting you. And if you're not in adjacent columns, then you won't have any weight. Um, so if you're in different columns and rows, the weight will be zero. So I've gone ahead and done that here. So here is the, the network with some red squares. So here are the neurons. There's 16 of them. And if I put the mouse on a neuron, you can see all the weights connected to that neuron. And some of them are, these are all negative weights. Some of them are minus 7, some of them are minus 5, some of them are minus 1, minus 4, and so forth. Uh, y, well, let's go and look at some of these. So why is this weight uh, minus 7? It's because those two neurons are in the same row as each other, the purple and green one. All right? So all of these 7s are for neurons that are in the same row as each other. So I, I just picked 7 to be a distinctive number. That's the negative weight for being in the same row. Here's some more 7s. And then here's some more 7s for ones that are in the bottom row, which is the same row as each other. And these sevens are all for neurons in the top row. OK. Now, why is this a five? Well, that's because those two are in the same column as each other. And all the fives are for neurons that are in the same column as each other. All right. Click, 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 click. Now, why is this a one? Well, that's a one because that's A and B and they're in adjacent columns, so we need to know about the distance between them. I'll just put the mouse on this one. All of those red weights are one because those are neurons that, if both of them are on, A comes next to B in the tor. These ones are one because the distance from B to C is one, and if those pairs of neurons are on, then B is coming next to C. These are one because uh, the distance between C and D is 1, etc. So my actual distance table says A to B is 1. B to C is 1. And C to D is a distance of 1. Meanwhile, A to D is inexplicably, is inexplicably far. You can only get there on a direct road of length 6. And we've got 4s between A and C, and between B and D. So that's my assumed length for this example. So this is the little triangular thing in the back of the the A, A to Z map. OK, have I explained all the weights? We've got fours, we've got sixes, we've got fours, and all of those I've now explained. So we've looked at every single weight, and we know why it's there. They're all either one, four, six, or five or seven, or zero. So you've met every single weight in here. And now we can run the dynamics. I've also got a bias, and I've set the bias to um, minus 8, and, but I've got a minus sign convention here. That, I think that means plus 8, so that's encouraging neurons. Please switch on. If we didn't have that, none of them would want to switch on at all. So I just picked a bias of 8, and now we can go through the neurons and say, do you want to switch on? And A1 says, yes, I want to switch on, please. My activation is plus 8, so you go ahead and switch him on. Um, and then you ask uh, A2, do you want to switch on? And he says, um, my activation is plus 1. Yes, I want to switch on as well. That's actually not very good news, because it's not going to be a permutation yet. Um, but we keep going. Do, A3, do you want to switch on? He says, no way. My activation is minus 6. A4, all these activations are up in this orange uh, square here. 
A4, do you want to switch on? No, my activation is minus six, leave me alone. Um, does B1 want to switch on? Um, his activation is plus two. He says, yes, switch me on, please. Uh, B2 says, no, leave me alone. B3, uh, he's got an activation of zero, so we could toss a coin and decide whether to uh, turn him on or not. Anyone got a coin? Okay, um, let's flip this, uh, toss a coin. Someone say heads or tails. Okay, uh, that uh, means that we don't turn it on. All right, um, that was a tails. Uh, B4, uh, do you want to switch on? He's got a, an activation of zero. All right, uh, let's have the opposite outcome. Someone say heads, heads, and that one goes on. Right, uh, C1, does it want to go on? No, it's stable. Does C2, no, it's stable. Does C3, it's unstable. It wants to, to go on. It's got positive activation, so there it goes. C4 is stable, so we leave it alone. D1 is stable, D2 is stable, D3 is stable, D4 is stable. And now we keep on running the dynamics. A1, what do you want to do? Oh, it wants to change, oh, make your mind up, mate. It wants to change back. A2, that's stable, stable, stable. B, unstable, okay. Stable, stable, stable. C is stable, C2, C3, C4. D, stable, unstable, okay. <laughs> and that one's stable, B4 is stable, back up to the top, A1, stable, A2, unstable, all right, make your mind up, <laughs> Three, stable, 4, B, mm, stable, stable, stable. You can be assured we're not going to be here forever because this thing is minimizing an objective function, so eventually we'll reach a fixed point, that's stable, 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 D, stable, 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 okay, A1, what do you think is going to happen when we look at this one? It's unstable. Plop. Okay, and now they are all stable, happy bunnies. So what's happened? It has settled down, and it's in a state that does implement a permutation, and that might actually be the optimal tour. I can't remember. You can check. Okay, so that's a hot field network being used to solve an optimization problem, an NP-complete problem. <laughs> um, Okay, don't, don't be impressed by people who sometimes solve NP-complete problems. They can never do it reliably. Um, but that's an interesting thing to do with a neural network. And uh, Sri Ayer, who was a student in the engineering department here back in 91, for his PhD said, well, let's take this hot field network idea. It's actually a bit broken to have an objective function that's a sum of a rule plus the thing you want to minimize. So let's uh, update the way hot field networks work in such a way that we don't have a competition between trying to minimize the distance and obeying the rules. So he, he tweaked things a little bit and came up with a, a much better version of this hot field network optimization algorithm. It involved continuous neurons that gradually get switched on. It's like ha starting in a high temperature state and uh, reducing the temperature. And uh, here's a picture of his network solving the traveling scholar problem, which is the task of visiting all the Cambridge colleges. So. That was fun. The final thing I want to say is, and this is a personal story of, of how my understanding of neural networks uh, um, evolved into something useful. Here's a question for you. I've been talking a lot. I want you to talk to each other for a minute and say, what is this probability distribution? Okay, so have a chat to each other and see what you think it might be. You're allowed to make hubbub. Indeed, I would really like you to make hubbub.
one, three, four, seven. To give you a possible hint, I've drawn on the board just now a graph associated with the function I've written down there. The graph contains a square node if the sum includes um, a term that connects together, that multiplies the variables that are, on the, uh, that are connected to that. So for each term in the sum, there's a black blob, or sorry, a white blob, and that white blob is connected to the terms that are coupled together. So, okay, the uh, answer is it's the graph of the 7 4 Hamming code. So, this probability distribution has what property? If beta is a big positive number, what happens? That means we favor states where x1 times x2 times x3 times x5 is equal to plus 1. Remember, all these x's are plus or minus 1 now. So what happens if you were to perfectly simulate this probability distribution, and if beta is quite large, which states would keep on coming up? Yeah. OK. What would keep on coming up would be states in which the parity of these four guys is even, and where the parity of these four is even, and states where the parity of these four is even, because then all four terms would be plus one. Yeah? And what's another name we give to states, x1, x2, x3, up to x7, that have the property that the parity of these four is even, and the parity of these is even, and these is even? Those states are? They are the code words of the 7-4 Hamming code. So this is the graph of the 7-4 Hamming code, and the probability distribution on the board is the probability distribution that sits with lots of mass on all of the code words symmetrically. And it assigns very little mass to non-code words. OK? So this hasn't got us anywhere. It's just a, an observation. Hmm, that probability distribution, which is a sum of simple terms, that probability distribution is the probability distribution of the set of all code words of the Hamming code. So, question two. What is this? <whistles> Do um, make hubbub again. I'm drawing the graph of this function for you. And the question is, what's the probability distribution? The graph of the function just involves simple terms. Each term is bn times xn, where b is some constant that I haven't told you. So that corresponds to adding an extra node to each of these variables. OK, so what is this? Um, that's connected to 3, and that's connected to 2. Were you saying? I've got two fives. Yes, well done. Thank you. Good. Well done. Sorry about the mistake. So what, what is this probability distribution? What could it be? OK, so we've added a bias to each bit. And in one, what context might you get such biases and say, yes, this is an interesting probability distribution? OK, let me help. So let's imagine that someone is sending code words using a 7-4 Hamming code. So they spit out T. And it goes over a channel, which is the binary symmetric channel, and out comes R, which is the received thing that differs by some flips using a, a, a bent coin. And you receive R. And now you want to solve the problem of saying, given R, what do I think the code word was? And therefore, what was 
S. Okay? So their encoding operation was they picked a T from the first distribution. So we call that P naught. So they used P naught because we haven't got a clue which S they chose. Therefore, they picked at random, from our point of view, one of the code words. So they drew T from P naught. Then we got an observation. We get to see R. And R is a noisy version of T. So in terms of graphical model, R gives you biases on each of the bits. So the posterior probability, which is what you want for decoding, is posterior probability of T given R is the product of P of R given T times the prior probability of T normalized. This term here is P naught of T. And this one is a product of terms, one for each of the bits, product from 1 to n, of the probability of R n given that T n, which you can write, if you want, as e to the B n times T n, give or take some, some factor. All right? So the answer to question two is, this probability distribution here is the posterior probability of the code word given the output of a binary symmetric channel. Or, in fact, not just a binary symmetric channel, any channel where each bit is independently uh, communicated. So um, binary symmetric channel would be the special case where all the BNs are, say, plus 2.7 or minus 2.7 and they'd all be the same value, 2.7 repeated lots of times with pluses or minuses, depending whether the output bit is um, a 1 or a 0. If it's another channel, like a Gaussian channel or something like that, then all the BNs would be different from each other. Apologies for the technical problem. I'm going to have to re-speak the lecture from here onwards. So this observation that the error-correcting code decoding problem can be expressed in terms of a probability distribution which upstairs in the exponent is a sum of simple factors and the observation that the Hopfield network can be viewed as an approximation to a probability distribution that is the exponential of a sum of simple factors. In the case of the Hopfield network these factors are just quadratic with terms like wij x i x j. This observation motivates the idea maybe we could take the decoding problem of an error correcting code and solve it using approximate methods too. So I'm not just talking about the 7-4 Hamming code but the idea is to generalize, take other error correcting codes, express their decoding problems in the terms of in terms of e to the power of a sum of simple factors and then use for example a variational method to approximate that distribution and hopefully find the maximum of the posterior distribution and in 1995 that's what I did I wrote a paper called free energy minimization algorithm for decoding and cryptanalysis and I made some random simple error correcting codes and I decoded them using variational methods very similar to the Hopfield network we've been looking at. The error correcting codes I made had the form of an identity matrix on the right hand side and on the left hand side just some sparse random ones. These are called low-density generator matrix codes. And when that work looked quite promising, it, there were no record-breaking results from it, but it was promising enough that I carried on looking at this topic and discussed with Radford Neal the questions. First, can we do better than variational free energy minimization as a decoding algorithm for codes like these? And secondly, for what error-correcting codes do these sort of sparse 
graph-based message passing decoding algorithms work the best? Which error correcting codes are best suited to these sort of algorithms? And what we found was that we could, in fact, do better than variational free energy minimization. We rediscovered the idea of using an algorithm called the sum product algorithm, which is also a message passing algorithm on a sparse graph. Um, and it also has a variational interpretation, but it was a better algorithm than variational free energy minimization. The second thing we did was we tried to invent new error correcting codes, and we invented a range of error correcting codes, all of which uh, were better than these low density generator matrix codes, and some of them were quite exotic. And the very best ones that we came up with were actually first invented in 1962. Bob Gallagher, who was one of the founding fathers of information theory along with Shannon and others, invented low density parity check codes for his PhD thesis. And in 1996, Radford Neal and I wrote a paper showing that you could actually achieve near Shannon limit performance with these error correcting codes. You'll remember back in lecture one we discussed the diagram of performance of error correcting codes with rate along the horizontal axis and error probability on the vertical axis. We had repetition codes that weren't very good. We had some other codes like the 7-4 Hamming code that were better. And we had this remarkable result from Shannon which is that there exist error correcting codes then that can achieve rates anywhere up to the capacity with error probability arbitrarily small. And we made low density parity check codes, which are very similar to low density generator matrix codes, but they look like this. Instead of having part of the matrix be sparse and part of it an identity matrix, the whole matrix is sparse with three ones per column, three ones per column all the way across or it could be some other number like four or five, but the results I'm about to show you are for three ones per column. And so here on the screen you can see a parity check matrix with 20,000 columns and 10,000 rows. And if you look very closely, you'll see that there are three ones in every single one of those 20,000 columns. The picture on the top right shows you a transmitted vector which consists of 10,000 bits set by the user, that's the top half of that transmitted image, and then the 10,000 bits that follow it are the parity check bits which are set in such a way that all the 10,000 constraints in the parity check matrix, uh, the 10,000 constraints defined by the parity check matrix are satisfied. And when you send that over a channel the received vector looks like what we see in this next slide here. This is a binary symmetric channel that flips 7.5% of the bits. And the animated GIF that we will insert here somehow shows the decoding of this particular received noisy vector. It takes about 13 iterations for the sum product algorithm to figure out uh, what the correct state was. And the animated GIF um, loops through a, a few times showing the decoding process. The performance of this particular error correcting code which has rate one half for the binary symmetric channel with a flip probability of 7.5% is shown in the right hand side of this slide. It has an error probability a little bit smaller than 1 in 10 to the 5 and that's quite close to the Shannon limit which is a bit bigger than a rate of 1 half and it's much closer to the Shannon limit than any of these textbook codes which are shown by the uh, pluses in the figure. And this rediscovery of Shannon's low density parity check codes had a significant effect on the field of information theory and coding theory. In 1997, there was 
at the International Symposium on Information Theory, the big information theory conference, there was just a single paper on low-density parity check codes, namely the one by me and Radford Neal. Five years later, the same conference had six entire sessions devoted to low-density parity check codes alone, and a total of ten sessions full of papers, all on the topic of sparse graph codes, which are codes like these low density parity check codes defined in terms of sparse graph codes. Once it was established that you could get good performance from message passing algorithms on sparse graphs, a whole industry was created inventing different sorts of sparse graph codes that, that could take advantage of message, message passing. So my intention here is to show you how if you look out for connections you can discover that everything is connected. I'd like to thank you very much for watching these lectures. If you've watched all 16, you get a special prize. Uh, in addition to a free electronic copy of the textbook on information theory, inference, and learning algorithms, you are also welcome to download now a free copy of my other book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Here are the two websites for you to download the, your prizes from. So thank you again for watching these lectures, and a big thank you to Emily Marie Nell for doing all the hard work of putting these video lectures together. Thank you.